and you have to have the ability to, to create and maintain privacy of individual issues, but, but sort of transparency of governmental or shared, you know, things like endowments. So, and, and all of these things are tools within an ecosystem, and you can't fiddle with one without looking at all the others. Um, and, and so if you, so, so take where I live in Tennessee, if you implement a gold and silver currency in here or, or a, you know, a, a local currency here, um, but you don't institute food freedom because right now incomes are plummeting across the United States. And one of the major reasons why they're plummeting is because you have, you have destroyed small farms not with technology and not with, uh, you know, the big guys being more efficient. You've destroyed it by rigging the rules, both with respect to food regulation, food safety, all sorts of food issues, along with the rules about how you can circulate equity capital locally to make it impossible for small farmers who would be highly competitive in a market economy um, you know, you've basically thrown so many handicaps on them that, that they've collapsed. And that, you know, ultimately our GNP, any GNP around the, around the world is, a, is a, in one sense, a multiple of the small farm income and, and, the, and the ability of people to feed themselves without having to go to a corporation, to, you know, and having to produce paper money or any kind of money to get it. So, um, uh, so, so just remember on, on the on a currency, the important thing is not just what we do with the currency, but what we do with a whole other host of government rules and regulations, um, because there's no way to get a sound currency without food freedom. Okay. And right now, yeah. if if you look at what's happening, I really, if you have never seen it, and you can only watch one video. They can explain what's going on in the economy today. Um, you can find it on my blog. If you do a search on my blog for Sir James Goldsmith, you will get an interview of Sir James Goldsmith in 1994 on Charlie Rose trying to he come to the United States to persuade Congress not to adopt the Uruguay Round of God and not to institute the World Trade Organization. And he said, if we do this, we will industrialize agriculture globally, and it will be you know, it will be the most disastrous governmental policy ever implemented in Western civilization, and it's quite brilliant, and he's dead on, um, and it describes exactly what's happening today. And um, so so it's it's really, really important when you talk about currency that you talk about it into, in the context of who's in control, how it's governed, and how it dovetails with the most important management and distribution of the of the most critical assets that we depend on for life itself. Okay. Thank you for your perspective on that. In some of your other interviews, you've intoned that you believe that there will not be a confiscation of gold and silver as they do not represent a significant portion of the wealth and savings of the average American family, like it was back in the 1930s. When the last underpriced forced sale back to Uncle Sam occurred, things were very different in the financial system and where they are today. Instead, now today's Mr. Global Evil Financial Overlord and Minions in government will instead today target retirement savings, uh, 401ks, IRAs, since that's a much larger pool of funds that exist. First, have you seen any legislation that is already enacted that would be or could be contorted to be the Trojan horse enabling this, or is there pending legislation that would enable it if it were to be enacted? Okay. Oh, that's a good. Let me let me take a whack, and if I don't hit everything, you know, just remind me. Um, first of all, uh, most people globally have already experienced tremendous confiscation of their assets. And that's what debasement has been. So between 2003 and 2008, um, uh, you know, a $10,000 CD earning 5% lost half of its purchasing power in five years, whereas gold, even after tax on capital gains, you know, basically held its purchasing power when measured in gallons of gasoline. 
Now, if you if you tra if you take that one example, and I've done several blog posts on this, and you and you step back and you look at a community of 100,000 people during that period, what that meant was that by the end of 2008, in the last five years, they had lost 3.3 billion dollars of purchasing power as a as a combination of households, municipality, and community businesses, which is astonishing. I mean, that's a huge confiscation. Yes. If somebody had had marched, you know, the National Guard into that community and taken 3.3 billion, whether it was 401ks or gold or whatever, you know, there would have been a war. And yet, yeah. you know, yet they managed to do it. So make no mistake that that confiscation is happening now. How is that confiscation happening? My my fear is not that they're going to confiscate your gold, and it's not even that they're going to confiscate their, your 401k. My fear is they're going to confiscate your body and your mind. Because the way I confiscate your money is I fill your mind with entrainment and subliminal programming and all sorts of disinformation, and I fill your body with, you know, a ton of, of poisons, whether it's fluoride in the water or, you know, GMO food or it's, you know, whatever they're spraying in chemtrails. And by the time I've hit your body and mind with that cocktail, you can't think clearly. And... And, for example, the debasement, you know, which was extraordinarily profitable for them, the debasement just people have suffered worldwide in the last 10 years. Um, the reason that debasement can happen with, with very little political pushback, I think, is related, in fact, to the, you know, basically the confiscation of your, of your body and mind. But let's keep going. If, if you look at my homepage at Solari.com, at the bottom, there's a list of some special Solari reports we did, and one of them is proposals for the annuitization of 401ks and IRAs, and it describes the proposals that were being considered last year. Um, there was testimony in the fall regarding this. Uh, the reason I'm con so concerned about it is exactly what you mentioned, which is that as the pressure comes on to finance Social Security, you know, for, for decades now, the boomers right. have been cash flow positive. They've been pouring cash into the trust fund, and, of course, the government's been using to finance a whole variety of things um, with that money. Now, not only are they, you know, they're continuing to put in cash, but we're we're anticipating the day when that cash is not available to pay, you know, for general governmental operations the boomers want that cash back. And so, so that's a $2 problem because the new dollar isn't available to finance your operations, and now they want a dollar back. So now you've got a $2. Instead of having a dollar, you know, positive cash flow, now you've got a $2 negative. And so that's why you're seeing this debate about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, not, not because uh, the trust fund isn't, you know, from an accounting standpoint, in reasonably good shape. It's because from a cash flow standpoint, They've emptied it out, and they need to keep emptying it out. And so, you know, the question is you can't keep using it to finance all sorts of stuff if people want it back. And so if you look at the U.S. debt clock and you say, okay, well, how, where are they going to get the money to finance it? It's pretty simple. The, politically, the logical thing, place to get it is from the people who want their Social Security check and just require their 401ks and IRAs and pension funds finance it. Now, if you look at who, in fact, owns the U.S. government debt, um, the biggest source of money to the U.S. government debt is not the Chinese and Saudis. As I said last night, it's the U.S. pension funds and retirement savings. So it doesn't, you know, it's the Willie Horton thing. You, you rob the bank that has money. So I think the 401ks and IRAs are a huge part of wealth, and particularly as the 401ks are pretty easy to tap into, um, getting to the IRAs may be a little more difficult and complicated, but... Um, if you just look at the numbers, it's a no-brainer to say it gets there. Now, could they confiscate gold? Yeah, but you get very little money, and you, you end up picking the most stubborn or wrathable and empowered to fight people who have the wherewithal to fight. <laughs> so, you know, I just think you – why take – it's like having a fight with a mule when you're not going to get any filet mignon. Why not just go after, you know, the steer? Yeah, low-hanging fruit certainly is easier to go after. Okay, um, 
The reason I had asked is there have been any number of discussions that have occurred within the forum as to should we be cashing out our 401ks and IRAs, um, and should there be something uh, – from a legal front that looks like it might be confiscatory, uh, people were curious, uh, is this something that I should be doing? Should I cash it out? So uh, with that in mind, what are your views of the best ways for U.S. citizens to protect their wealth? Everyone's situation is different, obviously, right. and no solution fits all people's circumstances and needs, but should they cash out their retirement accounts, taking the penalties and tax hits, invest in farmland for self-sufficiency and that food security that you were talking about before? Should they own their own home free and clear, getting out of that debt trap, uh, assuming they intend to stay there, of course, buy or potentially buy an essential services business like a corner gasoline station or some other non-luxury goods and or services merchant where they will be sustainable in their community? Well, I know this sounds like a cop out, but I really find everybody is different. So let, let me just go through the IRA and 401k. Okay. I don't have an IRA, 401k, nor will I ever. It's just not going to happen. Um, because what I've found over the long sweep of things is whatever benefit you get, and the possible exception is a match on a 401k, so um, whatever benefit you get, they, they find a way to siphon away. Now, I've if you go to my blog and do a search, you'll find a description of why, you know, the specific reasons why I don't have one and never would um, because I had a very political situation on a 401k and had to bust it and pay 200 and it was part of a squabble with the federal government. So it's very political and I just, you know, I said this is a gestalt thing. I, I want to control my money and I'm going to organize my finances so I have control. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to get in partnership with somebody whose word is meaningless and who abrogates contracts and uses dirty tricks. So, but my situation is a little bit different. What I try and encourage people to do is to keep an eye on this and to make sure they build assets outside of IRAs and 401ks, so that okay. they don't end up completely dependent uh, on the system. So I think it's a, it's a matter of balance. And uh, there are lots of different ways you can use an IRA, uh, not a 401k. It depends on the provisions. Um, the plan. To do, yeah, to do, I mean, there, there are ways you can do all sorts of things that aren't just same old, same old in the brokerage system. So, um, and, and ultimately, though, the decision as to whether you have, you take it out or not, to me, is a political call, and each person has to, you know, has to make it on. It's not a financial call. It's a, it's a political guess. Um, but I do say I, I monitor it very closely because I have clients who are prepared to jump. And so the one thing you do is if you do have IRAs and 401ks, you just want to know what you're going to do if the if it should look like the capital controls are going to make it a lot less attractive, and you just need to be prepared to jump. Um, if you have a tax situation where it's easy to take some out now without penalty, you know, it's certainly more attractive to do that than if there's a penalty or if it kicks you into a new tax bracket. So it takes a little planning to kind of figure out the most advantageous way to get it out. But whether or not you get it, you know, if you don't get it out, you need to be prepared to jump if that day should come or to let it get stuck and be an annuity or whatever it is, but then just assume that's your long-term dollar exposure as part of your portfolio. Now, in terms of what else you do, um, I think – uh, you know, that's a complex question, but number one is our balance sheets have been intermediated. That's number one, which means, you know, once upon a time we, we grew our own food and um, we did things for ourselves and we didn't need money um, because we were doing more stuff for ourselves. Now what we're doing is we're putting our money into the company stock and then we're buying our food at the company store and, and, and the, you know, we've basically been disintermediated. I tell the story of three women in Tennessee who um, one was owning city core stock at about, I think she at the time she was estimating she was getting 4 or 